Why did you have to go there, Jerry? <laughs> I didn't go anywhere. I didn't go anywhere. Welcome to Fairway to Heaven, a Lip Golf podcast. My name is Sue Ann Hang, and with me is Jerry Fultz. As always, my co host. We're back in our Zoom boxes because we're back in our respective homes. Um, how are you feeling, Jerry? Are you uh, jet lagged? I, I honestly don't know how you do it. That is such a pain. And I mean, that's such a long travel day. Fortunately, the big flight, which was South Korea to Dallas, I slept almost the entire flight. And now, you remember how wow. last week? I couldn't get to sleep at night and everybody else is waking up at 3 a.m. too, jet lag. Now I have the reverse jet lag. Now I literally can't get out of bed. Karen woke me up today at 11 a.m. and I was in a dead sleep. She says, what time's your doctor's appointment? I'm like, what? <laughs> so yeah, like 12 hours of sleep last night. That's when you know you're old. You wake up and your wife is asking you when your doctor's appointment is <laughs> at 11 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> If by some chance I didn't think I was old, you remind me every fucking day. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. That, that's mm -hmm. what I'm here for, Jerry. That's mm -hmm. what I'm here for. Um, all I right. Know. Well, a few things happened. Let's let's recap oh, Hong Kong last week. Uh, first of all, that was this is our we've had four events. We've had two playoffs. Yeah. <laughs> I know. That's that's awesome. But it was, I mean, it was such a we the Abraham answered teeing off with a five-stroke lead. Basically, it was his mm -hmm. tournament to lose, and he did. He lost it. And then he he summoned up the courage, the heart, the guts to hit the shot of the day in his in his words on his approach shot at 18 and, and got it done. That was uh it was pretty cool to see him. You know, that was a little bit, you know, he's a world-class player. He's won a world golf championship. He's won events all over um at every level mm -hmm. he's played. But that was a little bit about of uh, David versus Goliath right there. Yeah. Uh, and and I yeah. mean, at one point he had Rom chasing him, uh, Cam Smith, obviously who was in the playoff. Uh, who else was up there? Uh, Paul Casey. Uh, Paul Casey. Big name wise. Right. Yeah, everybody kind of petered out on Sunday. Everybody who who played a uh, who shot a really good round on Sunday was so far back they couldn't catch him. Waco playing his way right back up into the. That's right. He had a hole in one. We had two hole in ones on Sunday, didn't we? Yes, we did. Kale Walk, and Kale and yeah. Waco. Yeah. yeah. Kali, I think on hole two, was it? And Waka was 12. on hole eight. Yeah. 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 Yeah, that was pretty awesome. But uh yeah, it was was um Cam shooting a bogey free, I think four under on the final day and get him up there. Um, but that was a, a great playoff, by the way. The eighteenth hole, right. uh, if you've never been to Hong Kong Golf Club, is not an easy hole. Uh to do what Abe did on the playoff hole is insane yeah. to split the fairway well, first of all under that pressure and then to hit that second shot is clutch it, that was really clutch i know he struggled a little bit during the day um, with his game but obviously found it on the playoff hole <laughs> it, it is one of the toughest closing shot tee holes in all of championship golf i mean it is that tight and it's just unforgiving either side and you're pitching out second shot over the water um, yeah, but he did it twice. He did it in regulation and he did it in the playoff and just laced that. And that uh, whole location off. too. It yeah. was tough. You know, it was kind just of, like it was right over the ridge. Yeah. 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 It was awesome. Um, and then Anthony Kim got to talk about Anthony Kim. He shot 65. It was one of mm -hmm. the lowest scores of the day. And this is his sixth round back being competitive. Yeah. yeah. I know, and our guest I mean, coming on shortly, uh, I won't give it away, but uh, our guest coming on is tied with Anthony Kim in driving accuracy for last. And so we got to give him a little grief that, you know, a guy who hadn't touched a club in 12 years is hitting as many fairways as you. But, yeah, uh, yeah, but um, <laughs> Ant, that was... I, I look forward to you just dishing that to him too, by the way. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, no, no problem. He's such a nice guy. Um, but Anthony Kim, to me, I don't know about you, but to me, that's the story of the year. And I know I might have been a little bit hyperbolic during the broadcast, but I know what it's like to take a month off while you're playing full time. I know what it's I had a wrist surgery once and had to take three months off when you're playing full time. I know how quickly you lose everything you think you had. I mean, you don't forget how mm -hmm. to hit a golf ball. You don't hit it as solidly as often. You certainly don't know where the bottom of your swing is, but on and around the greens. And that's where he was phenomenal. And to shoot 65. He was third on, in putting. Uh, 65 on that golf course and be third in putting. And he putted good in Jetta as well. Um, 
I mean, his first tournament, he he top shanks his second shot in Jeddah on 18, his layup. <laughs> and he shanked another one later in the day. That's how lost it must have felt to him at the time. And then to somehow, in, in a matter of a week and two days, come back and shoot 65 on that golf course. That is one of the more astonishing accomplishments I've ever seen. In cold and wet weather, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I mean, the elements, you can't forget that. But yeah, I mean, I took two years off, I think, at one point I when I totally just decided to hang my clubs and was so done with golf took two years off and i remember the first day i picked up the club it felt so foreign to me like my it was like my body just didn't know how to move in that direction anymore you know so i can't imagine 12 years um but you know one thing i love about when i got to speak to him after was he said this one thing to me he goes it doesn't matter what i shoot I feel like I've won. And that was, I mean, and, and he said it, he said, I never thought that I would say that ever, you know, uh, but that's kind of his perspective now, isn't it? Uh, we don't know the depths of what the last 12 years were like for him. If there were depths or we don't know yeah. what he was doing. I know his story is going to come out yeah. soon when he wants it to. Hopefully we'll learn more. Um, but yeah. obviously he 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 made it sound like he was, you know, could have been in a really tough place for a while. And he's what he shoots doesn't matter. He feels like he's won the game of life. He has a little daughter who adores yeah. him. And he's a lot of he's, she's a lot of the reason he's even trying to do this to, you know, let her know what daddy was and, and yeah. maybe again. And uh, yeah. and that's all he really cares about is his his wife and uh, and little Bella. Um, yeah. so he feels like he's Super got a cute, new lease by the on way, life. Fella. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Super she cute. Is. All right, let's invite our guest. Let's not make him wait anymore. Uh, we do have a phenomenal human being, a great player. Peter Uline of the Range Goats is joining us today. Peter, let him in. There, there we he go. is. Yeah. How'd you do that? Sorry, <laughs> Shocker. Um, how are how is life with two kids? Congratulations, by the way. You know, I thought I thought with one kid we didn't have a lot of time on our hands, but then I realized with a second kid we had a ton of time with just the one. So <laughs> it's uh it's good. It's nice though, it's fun. Yeah, and how's Tucker? How's Tucker as a big brother? Loves it. He loves it. He like he likes to how's Tucker now? He's two? He's two. So they have the same same birthday. They were born on the same day. No That's way. right. Yeah. So um, he loves it though. He he smothers her with affection and a little bit aggressive currently. So, <laughs> but it's fun. It's cool. <laughs> That's awesome. I love Tucker. Tucker's so cute. Yeah. He'll He's be so in my. Cute. He'll just be in little, my. Like little blonde kid just running oh, yeah. around like the players' yeah. lounge and stuff. <laughs> yeah, he takes after. He takes after Chelsea. He's very bubbly and very nice and affectionate. So it's good. You're pretty bubbly yourself and pretty affectionate and pretty nice. No. Just, you just made Chelsea spit out her drink. <laughs> <laughs> so, no. Oh, that's um, hilarious. Yeah. Wasn't there like a little baby boom recently in Live Golf? Because I remember you guys were expecting last year, and there are a few others were as well. Yeah, Scott Scotty, Vincent, Vincent, and Taylor. So we. Uh, oh yeah. And then obviously with AK joining, we he's got a little one. Um, and then Emily, I think from the Range Goats. Yeah, she had one. She was expecting two at yeah. the same time. Yeah. And then Rom joined. Well, he's got two kids, so it's it's kind of it's. I think Miami will be cool because. At the start, it didn't seem like there were a lot of families out in the first few, but uh, I think once my, or I guess maybe once the, once we're back from like Singapore and the stateside, I think more, or summertime, more kids will start coming out. It'll be fun. Yeah. I, mean, I thought Miami cool. was pretty crowded in the lounges. Like everyone's families were there. I think yeah. DJ brought his kids. Yeah. Louis yeah. It'll be cool. Kids. Yeah. Most, his, yeah. It seems like, kids. seems like everyone will. So. Yeah. Nice setup. Well, thanks for that's joining a, us. That's a cool setup. Look at that. <laughs> you talking about Fulty or me? Both. I mean, you guys got wow. it's like real professional. Man. Yeah. 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 Look at yeah. that. <laughs> it's the live golf way. Man. Suzanne's in her 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 house in uh, yeah. Singapore, and I'm in my what used to be a carport in uh, in Hicksville, Orlando. <laughs> 
And everything in the background, uh, Peter, is not his. It, it's <laughs> no. all that Hall of Fame stuff is yeah, not yeah. his. Yeah. It's Karen's. Oh, the stuff. Bud Light sign. Yeah, the yeah. Bud Light sign. The Bud Light chairs. Yeah. 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 And then yeah. and the dartboard. Exactly. And the dartboard, right? Of course. And the longboard above it, you bet. There you go. Well, Jerry pointed out something before we got on. I'm going to dive right into it, as I always do. I just come in with a straight punch in the face with yeah. all of our players. <laughs> but Jerry pointed out that uh, Blame it something on me. along the lines of, yeah, well, I'm going to talk about his driving stat. How okay. about you tee him up? You do it. What do you well, want to know? No, last, <laughs> last year he hit it as long as anybody. He was the longest guy on live. That's pretty impressive amongst those guys. This year, it's not exactly staying in the fairway. And no. what was re uh, the recent stats are you're tied for last in fairways hit with a guy oh. who hadn't played in 12 years. Honestly, that's that's an improvement to what I was expecting. So I was expecting <laughs> to be dead last. No. Tied. Yeah. <laughs> It is uh it's short and crooked right now. It's not a good combo. <laughs> it's <laughs> it's a little it's a little it's a little rough off the box for me right now. Um mess I was trying I've always played like a a big titleist head TSR2. I've always played the bigger ones and then in Hong Kong and Saudi I put a smaller head in to try and it Ooh. just it, it didn't work those are those oh, are the no. good pl th those are the places to do that yeah yeah <laughs> those it, two courses. <laughs> it didn't work so back to back to bigger my guy uh my the guy i work with is at the players this week and so um they're they brought some heads down for me and i'll, I'll try them out for miami so what was the thought the thought the, the thought was i was driving it so bad i might as well just try something totally different and yeah it didn't really work so i'm gonna go back to back to kind of what i know a little bit um i don't know i i i don't know it's just it's been a little bit it's been a little bit rough to start the year i know i played i had a good week in vegas but i i was probably like plus 15 in putting or something ridiculous so that uh it didn't i didn't really do anything that good in vegas other than just putt so um it's been a little bit it's been a little bit rough to start the year but it in hong kong on sunday it, or saturday sunday it felt better i could tell it was feeling better so that's kind of nice and then uh and then we'll see how it goes in miami i mean the fact that you last year if you you didn't drive it as well as maybe you'd like to but you mm -hmm. still came in 12th on the on the um what are we calling it Fultzy? The, the tables the league the standings table. yeah the yeah. league standings thank you yeah. um you came in 12 yeah even not driving it as well as you like to and and stuff i mean what what do you think the strength of your game is at the moment probably putting i'm i'm a pretty good putter typically um yeah wet, i'll say yeah wedging putting <laughs> inside 100 yards i'm quite good i feel like i'm quite good um and then and then converting i i typically make a lot of birdies um yeah for me it's for me it's just get off the box really it's, and give myself it, it's not even really hit fairways but at least put myself in a position to where i can attack some holes even if it's on you know if the pin's on the right side of the green you know if i'm on the left side good angles kind of things like that so um for me it's it all kind of comes down to putting and, and wedging and if i do those well then I feel like I can kind of contend and can and compete and make a bunch of birdies, which which is what you got to do in in a fifty four hole format. I spoke to Zach, your caddy. Uh, I think this was in Jeddah when I was walking with you one mm -hmm. one of the days, and he said to me, "He goes, your game really starts after you tee off." <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what that means. <laughs> he goes like that's where you shine, basically. He goes that's where you you know you really make your golf great. Like once yeah. you get off the tee box, you figure it out and you you find a way to score from there, uh, which is what you just basically yeah. told us. Zach, Zach and I talk about it. Like, trust me, I would love to like hit it just like dead straight, like a lot of guys. But like I don't, I don't view myself as like a as a swinger of the club per se, like I just view myself as a golfer and, you know, there's more, there's always more than one way to skin a cat. So, and I feel like that's why I like when it gets like windy and tough and cold or even if it's hot and windy, like it kind of brings in the field a little bit from, you know, 
from an accuracy standpoint, it kind of makes everybody kind of play the style of game that I play all the time. So I, I feel very comfortable when the weather gets tricky and windy and um, I don't know. I just, I, it, it's just more of a natural feeling for me, but yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't typically play the, like I'd love to hit it like Louie or Sergio or those guys, you know, uh, be efficient, but that's just not the way I play. And, um, you know, I just like to say I'm more of a golfer than a, than anything. Is your game different yeah. now? The, let's go back 15 years and four and zero at the Walker cup. The next year you win the U S amateur at uh, chambers Bay. Um, is your game different now than when you were the number one ranked amateur in the world coming out of Oklahoma state and how? I, I'd like to say I'm I'm a lot better. <laughs> I'd like to think that. Um, I, I think I think a lot of it is, you know, it, when we play golf, it's obviously it's you progress, right? Like there's there's ebbs and flows in the game, but as long as you kind of keep evolve, keep getting better, and keep developing, and I feel like I'm a much smarter golfer now than I was back then. Um, didn't know things like in college, like I didn't particularly know any like distances, wedges, irons, anything. Just, you know, I just kind of just played and tried to shoot a score. And then now it's like, I've kind of fine tuned that a little bit better. Short games, a little bit sharper putting. I've always been a good putter. Been very fortunate. Uh, I've always been, I've always putted really well. And uh, just kind of little things like that, that I've kind of learned, but that's just kind of comes with it. Right. Like, when I turned pro, um, went over and played the challenge tour uh, right away and then kind of just grew up, you know, in college, you're kind of in a little bit of a bubble and you don't really experience things. And then when I, when I turned pro left challenge tour, European tour and just kind of learned, grew up and then just kind of developed my game that way and uh, loved it. Absolutely loved traveling and, and, and seeing the world and playing all these places and, um, felt like it just kind of helped me grow up a little bit, which was nice and which is what I needed. And from a golf standpoint, I think my game just kind of matured with it. And um, I'm still trying to, I'm seeing, I'm obviously, I'm still trying to get better, still trying to learn. And um, that's kind of, it's a never ending process with golf, right? So, yeah. Uh, your father is obviously a very influential person in the industry. And your mom was a really good golfer herself. Yeah. Um, from what I've read, mm -hmm. uh, how influential have their roles been in your life in terms of decision to to go to something like a challenge tour and and, and throw yourself in the deep end to to actually mature and grow up in 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 that way instead of staying in the US. Yeah, um just to kind of like a conversation I had with my dad, we were talking about uh, what I wanted to do when I when I turned pro and things and you know, I the guys I'd always kind of liked and kind of Norman Norman was before my a little bit before my time, but like the guys I like like Ernie and um and Adam Scott were kind of the guys that I always looked up to. And um, uh, you know, Norman was kind of the spearhead of that with those guys. Just kind of did. those guys were global players before they became stars on in the US. And so, you know, I didn't really view it as any different being an American. I was in my mind it was kind of the just it was golf. Right. So like, it didn't really matter to me where I was from. And my dad kind of, we talked about it and we thought it would be a good idea. And I had never really traveled the, the world really. Uh, I think I went down to Argentina once and, and then went over and played the open. Um, but other than that, I hadn't really seen anything. Didn't, didn't know anything about the rest of the world and just was really interested in it. And, um, once I did it, absolutely love traveling, love seeing it still do. So, um, yeah, it was pretty, it was, it was fun. I was, I, I tell people all the time that first year on the challenge tour, it's probably the most fun I ever had playing golf, going to some, some crazy places and seeing the world and just kind of like, cause you obviously weren't playing for a ton of money. So it's like you bunked yeah. up with a bunch of buddies. And, um, I remember it was me and Brooks and a guy named Scott Pinkney and my buddy Colin was carrying for me. We're all four of us in a hotel room in Russia together, staying together, same in Kazakhstan, and um, just kind of seeing the world, just traveling together. And it was it was a lot of fun. And um, it's definitely probably at the time was the most fun I've had since 
before joining Liv. Now Liv's probably the most fun at Tess. I love, I love it. So it's been good. <laughs> you uh, <laughs> uh, um, obviously so then hinted at your father, a legend in the industry, the former CEO of a Kushnet, which owns Titleist. Mm -hmm. um, and for as long as I can remember being a pro, I mean, your dad was there for a while. Did you have a choice what you were going to do with your life? when you were a kid yeah yeah, oh yeah. I say that i say that half tongue in cheek though no i i, mean, I my dad was my dad's been my dad's i mean my dad's been great you know he 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 let me be my own man early um he kind of didn't really he didn't push me towards anything i mean my favorite sport is baseball i love baseball i i was before i jumped on i was well, i was re-watching a spring training game with the angels and the and the royals if that tells you anything so I love baseball. I can, I can watch it all the time. And so that was kind of where I, what, what my interests were was baseball, but I just loved golf. And obviously it's in my, it's, I think at this point it was, it's in my blood and my mom's, my grandfather, my mom's dad was the head pro at Woodmont for 30 years. So it's just kind of in, it's just always been in our family. And uh, he didn't really push me to anything. I, I came to him at an early age being in Massachusetts um, weather's not great it's not like Singapore and uh, so it's a little Singapore's not great either Peter <laughs> no <laughs> yeah, it's not but it's good year on the weather is Massachusetts it snows so I remember playing uh, I think I was playing I, funny enough I think I was playing the Orange Bowl which was at Biltmore I think I got and I'm, I know I got paired with Rory the first round and he was just miles better than me and uh I think Ollie Fisher was the second guy in our group, but um, I just didn't feel like I could compete with them playing, you know, four or five months a year, which is what the, the season was in Massachusetts. So, um, so I went, uh, asked him what route I could do. And then he, they, at the time, IMG Academy was a, was a pretty good golf Academy. And um, at the time it turned out a lot of really good players. So um, that was, that was kind of my decision was to, go to a golf school year round and be able to kind of try and uh, develop my game and, and try and do it professionally at a pretty, I decided that when I was about 13. So I did it at a pretty early age and um, looking back on it, like now that I'm a dad, if my son did that, I don't know if I could let him go. <laughs> you know, it's, I, it's so funny you say that yeah. because I, I said the same thing because I left when I was 14. I went yeah. to Australia yeah. uh, for the same reason, actually, because I couldn't. We had at the time Singapore was such a young sport. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm not Singapore was a young sport. Golf was such a young sport in Singapore. Yeah. And we only had like two or three junior events. And I'm like, I can't, I got to yeah. compete more yeah. and play more. And so I left to Australia. And now I say the same thing. I'm like, there's yeah. no way yeah. if, if Casey was 14 yeah. that I would let him go to Australia. No yeah. chance. Wow. I don't know if I could do it. You guys are. You guys are so driven. I ran away once at 15 for about a week. So that was as close as I got. I'm serious. <laughs> I'm, I know you are. Uh, we'll get Not into that another moment. time, Fulton. Yeah. Um, Peter, so so you talked about, you know, the time when you decided you want to turn pro, the moment you knew you wanted to do this for a living. But when was it for you when you knew I can compete, I'm a world-class player, I'm going to be one of the best players in the world good question excellent yeah i mean i i feel like i'm still like i mean i, I view myself as a as a good player a very good player but i, I want to get better right and like so it's like it's kind of dictated off results right so we live in such a result driven world and I, you know i feel like when i when i contend and compete and you know that's that's when I feel like, like, Hey, this is what I love to do. This is what I enjoy doing. And, um, I, I don't know. It's one of those things. Like, do I feel like I can, cont I, I do feel like I can contend and compete with the best in the world right now. And, you know, just having the opportunity to do that on live with guys like Rom and Brooks and DJ and those guys and compete and cam. And those are just good moments for me. And, um, being able to do that on more of on a world stage is, is what I, which is what I want to do. And, um, I think, I mean, early on, I guess maybe it, it's funny. Like, cause I went to college with Fowler and Rick 
obviously took the tour by storm early on and then like but we played against each other and you play with them all the time and you're like ah, i can i can do this i can hang with him and so kind of early on i've always felt that and um now that you know it's been about 15 years or so or 12 13 years since turning pro and um you know i just still feel like i'm just still trying to get better and compete and 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 progress as a player and you know that that drive hasn't really stopped so Caleb Surratt came out out of college, yeah. hot shot. I mean, one of the best play, one of the best amateur yeah. players in the game, formerly number one in the world uh, amateur rank. I know there aren't that many spots in live, so it's not like a college kid can make that choice. But if that choice were available to you coming out of college way back when, um, would you think you would have sought that same route that he took? Yes, hundred percent. Yeah, I Why? mean to be able. I mean, look, he gets to play in practice with John Rom. I mean, what better guy to learn from, right? And then Tyrrell as well. I mean, those are, I mean, that's incredible. Um, and then to have the avenue of the Asian tour as well in the international series events to be able to travel. And they're, and they're not just in Asia, right? Like they're going to the UK, they're going, uh, they're going all Morocco. over. Morocco. Yeah. Oman. So yeah. 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 That's right. Just played Oman. Should have known that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> So yeah, they're they're going all over the world. So for a guy like Caleb, I think he's you know he just turned. I don't know if he's been playing, but I'm sure he's just kind of getting his feet wet a little bit. And then I think in a year or two he'll start playing a little bit more. Um, David Puig is a great like I I love what he's done. Like he's just gone yeah. everywhere and played every week, and I love that. I think for a kid that age and um, to be able to be with you know like someone like Sergio who's done this for 30 years, it feels like maybe. I might be, I might be selling his age. It's not far off. It's not far off. I might be selling his age a little bit there, but I don't know. Maybe, maybe 25. But, you know, for a guy like them to be, for David to be able to learn from him is just amazing. So, um, so seeing him going out and playing, like he went to Malaysia, won that, gotten in the open, like things like that, I think it's just so cool. And, um, and then to be able to practice with those guys with Abe and, and Sergio. And so it's just unbelievable for the development of these players and, um, yeah, hundred percent would have absolutely done it if it was around when, you know, when I was turning pro and, um, I, like I said, I've always loved traveling. So to be able to kind of play an international schedule and then jump and play Asian tour stuff and, um, things like that is pretty, is pretty awesome. Now, if you were to give Caleb advice, should he come to you for advice? If you haven't already, you guys have something in common, right? You guys were both the number one amateurs you both didn't really travel that much mm -hmm. um, right up to le you leaving and traveling, going to the challenge tour. If you were to give advice to Caleb or anyone who's perhaps in the same shoes as Caleb or thinking about doing the same thing, what mm -hmm. would you, what would you say to them? It's a good question. Um, I would tell them to play. I think, I think play like that's, I mean, I try, I'm trying to get Matt Wolf to play. <laughs> like, you know, Maddie's a little bit older, but like, that's what I'm trying to like, just get him to play. Like, I, I love, I love live. I love the schedule, but at the end of the day, I mean, 13, 14 with the team event, but you, you got to play more, especially at that age. You got to get up to 20, 20, you know, 25, 26. I think my, my first year uh, on the challenge, I was still playing challenge tour. I think, you know, I think I went to, I think I was gone for three months just playing. I think I spent about five weeks in South Africa. And then I went and played like some sunshine tour events. And, and then I think I went to India for two events and Dubai for a couple. And so like, I was just playing, like, I think that's kind of the, the best thing you can do for your development is just compete. And, uh, you know, regardless of where it is, even if it's just some games at home or, you know, we have minor league stuff down here, I'll, in the off season I'll play and just, just to, just to compete. And um, I think for guys like that, I think that's having a place to play is, is obviously the, the hardest and that's the trick, right. Is to get somewhere and then, you know, joining live for Caleb and David and those guys that getting access to the Asian tour and the international series events is great. So just to, just to take advantage of that, continue to play. Um, like I was talking to James Piot a little bit about it and, um, Tim. Piot. Piot, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I call him little Piot. <laughs> but yeah, little it's, Piot. It's, yeah, it's Riot Piot, right? James Piot. So 
same thing. Right. I was just talking to him about just playing, just go and play. That's, that's, you know, that's the best yeah. thing you can do for your game and development is just play. So um, yeah. the access these guys have now is, is incredible. So um, it, it's, it's pretty cool. You know, in in a uh, side story in line with what you're saying, because um, there are basically two college programs that turned out more uh, successful professionals early in their career than any other, and that is Oklahoma State and Georgia. And I know Chris Hack's a friend of mine. I'm sure you know him and love him, too. Mm -hmm. I asked him one time, what sets him apart from the other coaches? And he wouldn't give an answer. I go, what do you do differently? And that's the one answer he said. He goes, when the kids come to me, he goes, you can have your coaches, you can have your track man, you can have this, you can have that. I don't care. But when you're on my time, you're going to be on the golf course because that's where you learn how to be a good player. Not practicing, but yeah. playing. So I, I love that advice. Now, uh, what I was going to get at last time before old man senility uh, came to, you know, kind of invaded the brain. All right, Sue Ann. Um, was I, I was touching on you had early success, uh, came over when you finally came over, like you're a foreigner, came back to the States, got your status on the PJ Tour in a year, and you played really well that first year, not so well the second year. Do you feel like for some strange reason now, even though it's not apples to apples because it's live versus a PGA tour record back then, do you feel in any way like you might be playing the best golf of your life now? Is that part of the continual improvement? Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. I think there's, there's a lot of things I think that kind of went into my struggles, I think on tour. Um, I, I think I kind of picked up some bad habits, pressed a little bit too much, wasn't happy. Um, just a little, like, I, at the end, of the, like I said before, like, I wish it worked out on the PJ. I really do. Like, I, I, I enjoyed my time. I wish it worked out. It just, it wasn't for me. Um, and I don't think it was, it, there was a little bit to do. Like, I just wasn't really happy. Um, my wife and I kind of talked about it. We, hindsight's twenty twenty. Do I, do I wish I went, do I wish I stayed on the European tour? And I, I probably do, you know, I, I, I wish I'd never left and, um, kind of pre COVID right before COVID, I kind of had some stuff lined up to where I was going to go back to the European tour and play some events and try and get my card back. And, um, I just wasn't really as happy as I, I felt like I could have been playing on the PGA tour. And it is what it is. I mean, there, there's some guys who play in Europe and they come over and it just doesn't work out. And it's not, it, it's nothing negative towards them or, or towards anything. It just didn't work out. It wasn't really for me. And, um, I feel like I'm, I'm I'm obviously in a much happier place now, but at the same time, I feel like as a player, I've gotten better. I, like I said, I, I picked up some really bad habits and um, had to kind of rework it and went down, played some corn events, kind of was starting to play a little bit better and um, kind of with confidence was getting there. And, and then Liv obviously came around and, um, you know, the op once the opportunity presented itself, I felt like it was just something I couldn't pass up. And because because of the, the scheduling and the traveling and getting back more internationally is just something I like, and it's just something I'm comfortable doing. So um, once that opportunity came up, you know, I, it's funny. I felt like even before that, like I was starting to play a little better. My results weren't showing it, but I could see that like things were trending. And um, so live kind of just came at the perfect time for me. Um, I know you mentioned Brooks earlier, uh, you guys playing together back back in the day mm -hmm. uh you've now had bubba would be what your third captain mm -hmm. four third yeah third, third captain well third. if we don't count the the 2022 year i guess yeah you were well that was actually I was peter, captain. peter I was, was a, captain you in were a captain yeah. London, yeah. that's yeah. right smash was actually what was, was smash no, I, was, <laughs> I was the crushers i was the crushers man oh you were crushers, oh, crushers. i thought you were I smash crushers. no i was crushers <laughs> for one week and then bryson took over Oh, I thought you were the fart cloud. <laughs> no, I was the original not. No, logo. I would have okay. kept, gotcha. kept the fart cloud, to be fair. I like that one. <laughs> <laughs> the fart logo, I yeah. remember that. Um, and I know you, you have mentioned to me in passing that, you know, that those all three captains are so different. Mm -hmm. Could you maybe expand and share with us a little bit about <laughs> how different they are in terms of like being on each of their teams, you know? Um. Yeah, I mean, I, I think DJ and obviously Brooks and I, like, we go way back, have a good relationship with him. Um, we get along. We have the same. We're similar. We're similar styles. Sim the way we play is similar and um, just similar demeanors on the course. Same with DJ. DJ's DJ's such a great guy to, like, to, to be around. And both those guys are very helpful. Like, if, 
mean, anything in golf, asking questions. Um, same with Patrick Reed. Uh, just being able to talk to those guys has been has been tremendous and um, was great. And uh, Bubba, we're we're it's just new, right? Like I never really, I never, I never had a conversation with Bubba until the day I got traded or the day after I got traded. That was the first time me and him had ever spoken, really. So. I think we're just still trying to kind of feel each other out a little bit. It's a new new environment for him, new team. and um, So it's been a little bit of a learning curve. I know we haven't played as well, I think, as a team as we would have liked. But, um, you know, it's been it's been different for sure. You know, there, he's definitely different than, than Brooks and DJ. So, um, like I said, I think we're all trying to kind of feel each other out at this point. And hopefully we'll start playing a little bit better. What was your reaction when you got that phone call to get traded? My reaction was, I, my rea- I thought he was kidding. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I was, I was putting, I was about to put Tucker to bed. I was making him a bottle, and Colin, who was with, who works for the Four Aces, called. He was in town, and he's like, "Hey, I'd love to come by and see." You. I'm like. No, it's seven forty-five at night. Like, no, I got to put my son down. And so I was. He's like, man, I wish I didn't do this over the phone. And I was like, jokingly, go, like, would you trade me? And he's like, yeah, I did. I was like, oh shit, <laughs> did you? <laughs> and so, and he's like, oh, I was like, and so I was like, where'd you, where'd you trade me to? He's like, did the range goats? And I was thinking, I was like, it was for Harold, wasn't it? And he goes, yeah. I was like, huh. So Harold and I had actually played in Hong Kong together in November month or two prior and he was asking about he's like i'd love to get on the aces and i'm like dude there's no way you can get on the aces unless because i knew pat was coming back p reed wasn't going anywhere and i was like the only way you're getting on the aces is i get traded for you and then sure should i get traded and i'm like huh i wonder if i put that into the universe <laughs> so, um, so that's kind of how that happened it was it was yeah it was a shock i didn't expect it, it it's not like you know, because then immediately both the Pats, you know, they're calling me and you know, they're they're they thought I wanted to get traded. And it just it's like, no, it just it just happened that way. And I didn't ask for a trade. And um, it just just kind of worked out that way. And I'm happy. I, I'm happy. I feel like it. I feel like it's all kind of worked out where guys kind of should be where they are, I think, at this point. And, um you know, I didn't know the Taylor Wolf trade was in the works um, until maybe the couple of days later. I think Bubba kind of told me, and um, so yeah, it's been. It was definitely an interesting off season <laughs> for sure, and it's 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 good, it's good for the league, right? Like it's stuff like that's good for the league, and I know there's a trade deadline coming up, and there could be some movements there as well. So um, stuff like that is Do good. Tell. For- Oh, I don't, Do I don't tell. know. What do we I hear? Don't oh, huh? I don't hear anything. You know? <laughs> but I think. But look uh, at the team. Look at the team you have now. I mean, it's just, there's just so much. There was a ridiculous amount of team uh, talent on the four aces, obviously. Mm-hmm. But there, I mean, you get apples to apples now with the guys with your team now. That's just the potential is is unlimited. I think a couple guys yeah. haven't even seen their best play yet. Yeah, I mean that's that's kind of how it is, right? It feels like it's just potential at this point. Like you know, we haven't really strung anything together these first four events, but um, but just playing in the practice rounds, you can see like someone like Thomas, like from where it was like Maya Koba to where he was the practice round in like Hong Kong, like it's just so much better. Like it's just sharper. You can tell, and um, he's starting to practice a bit more, play a bit more at home and all this stuff because the weather's getting a little bit better for him in Belgium. And so you could see it's trending in that direction, which is nice. And, um, yeah. you know, Wolfie's obviously beyond talented. Um, his is just kind of, we just got to work on those six inches in his ears there. And um, But I think once he kind of figures that out as a golfer, like the sky's the limit. I mean, finished runner up at the US Open at 21 or something and won right out of college. So I mean the kids the kids are ridiculously talented. We just got to we just got to hone him in a little bit and um you know and obviously Bubba is a two-time major winner and still long as can be and you know our whole practice round I feel like I'm the shortest one in the group. So it's 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 been a lot of fun. Um I want to go back to to you talking about rooming with Brooks and then obviously you played on his team and then after that, you also got into a playoff with him in Jeddah. Mm-hmm. Um, what 
any good stories, any good stories about Brooks, you know, your experience with him? Um, <laughs> has he always been the same way as he is now, you know, yes. back when you were in yes. a motel? Yeah. Room? <laughs> yes, He's the exact same. He, he is the exact same kid. And uh, no, he's great. I mean, we, we, we stay in a room together in, in Nairobi, Kenya, um, Kazakhstan, wow. Finland, like we, we, UK, we, we stayed everywhere together and, um, Russia, um, India. So we did it. We, we stayed in all these places together and, um, he's the same guy just oozes confidence, believes in himself. Absolutely. 120%. And, uh, he was like that back then and he's the exact same now. So, um, it's happened. Like I was, yeah, I'm thrilled with all the success he's had. It's been, it's been incredible to watch. And um, from a from a game standpoint, he's obviously gotten a hell of a lot better. Uh, but he was still very good. He was, he was, he was still really good. And um, just kind of just fine tuned little things, and obviously took it to the next level, dominating in majors. But um, you know, he just has that kind of that that mentality where he just he believes he's better than everybody, and and uh, you know, walks the talk. So it's, it's pretty impressive and it's awesome to see. When, uh, yeah. when I'm going to change the subject a little bit back, a uh, little bit of politics, not a lot. I'm firmly convinced that there's a deal and there's a deal imminent between live and the PGA tour. And I don't have any knowledge for that other than just a, a read on the situation and Jay's words yesterday. I didn't know he had actually flown uh, to meet with Yasser mm. along with the SSG people in January. That's that's pretty telling. I think there's a deal. I think it's going to be done. I think it's going to be done soon, if indeed that happens. And uh, and there is a peaceful coexistence and, a, and an intertwining of the two entities. How many more tournaments would you play if allowed, if you were invited? Um, probably not many. Um, yeah. Probably not many, to be honest with you. I, I think I, I've what I personally like. You know, I love love live, love the schedule, and then I like to play some internationally. Like I, I just don't. I'm not overly interested in playing some like, but like, you know, there's an event like in the Dominican Republic. I'd go play that one. Like, even, I know it's like a small <laughs> opposite field one, but I'll go play it. You know, Mexico Vedanta. Like, I'd go play that one. Um, you know, but. That's cool. uh, yeah, I'd, I'd go play those, but I'm not, it is funny to me, like, am I getting in trouble for saying this, but like, I always see quotes from guys who are like, oh, these guys need to do this if they want to come back to the tour, do this, do this. I've not seen a single live person be like, I want to go back and play. Like, yeah. I'm sure it, like, like guys have come out and been like, oh, I want to play one or two events here and there, but like, no one's come out and been like, I want to play a 15 event schedule. So yeah. I don't, I don't know where some of that's coming from. And I just don't see how, I don't see how guys are going to be able to play 14 live events and then 15 PGA tour events and then majors, you know, like that's just, that's guys aren't, that's yeah, that's, guys aren't going <laughs> to play that. The thing I could see happening though, like if you do think there's a merger happening and, and, and it does happen, then like events, like, you know, like say like, let's just, just say, for example, the John Deere is like, you know, it's not an elevated event. So maybe guys can come back and play events that aren't elevated. And so, you know, if like the John Deere, if like Bryson wants to go play the John Deere, what's, you know, why not? Why can't he go play? You know, he's won there before the event might want him and he might bring good fanfare to the event. And so I think that kind of stuff couldn't exist. You know, we, I don't think they'll allow guys to come back and play. 15 events or i don't think they'll even allow them to play seven events off invites or whatever maybe they could play two or three and it'll be non-opposite field event or not excuse me non-elevated events and things of that nature so um i i think that that could possibly happen it, it, i i do think the 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 thing that's been lost in this whole shuffle i think is the european tour and i i partially feel more attached to the european tour than or the DP world tour or whatever. And um, I feel more kind of attached to that tour and I'm curious to see what's going to happen there. I don't feel like their merger has 
gone maybe as well as they would have liked. And <laughs> They've been shafted and you know a little bit. Absolutely so, hosed. Yeah. So I, I'm curious <laughs> if there is something that can be worked out with Live, the European tour, maybe the Asian tour and international series events, maybe kind of something coexisting mm. within that world. And then kind of the PGA tour kind of just kind of doing their own thing domestically. And um, so that that could be an option and that could kind of maybe solve some guys quests for world ranking points since Liv has kind of pulled out of it. So uh, that, that's yeah, we don't need world ranking points. <laughs> yeah. Don't. What are your thoughts on that? Don't need them. I mean, I'm about a thousand, <laughs> I'm about a thousandth in the world. I could care less at this point. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, I, I think this was, I think they should have done it a year ago personally. And me too. Uh, I agree. I yeah. told Greg that actually. Yeah. yeah. So this, yeah but, but the, it, it, that's a pointless argument now. It's, it's over. Yeah. It's done with. I, I like what Joy, uh, the guy who writes for a lot of the um, Asian tour golf, the guy mm -hmm. from India, Joy, I can't pronounce his last name. It's got 12 yeah. syllables. Yeah. yeah. Um, he wrote, it's like, maybe some of the smaller tours should consider the same thing because every rule change from the OWGR and the last, the last three or four rules changes they have only benefited the PJ tour. Yeah, and now most recently the corn Ferry tour and yeah. it's taken away from every other international tour. Why don't they all just say, you know what, just leave us out. If it's going to be yeah. a FedEx cup ranking, which essentially it is just, just quit hiding it. I agree yeah. with that, but yeah, they, neither they, here nerfed, nor there. they nerfed the European tour pretty hard. Even Japan, like I think back then you could win like three times, maybe get top 50 in the world yeah. or something. And yeah. now I don't think it's even possible for them. And uh, yeah, I mean, they've completely nerfed it, unfortunately, but um, nerfed it's... it. <laughs> it's I like that gun. expression. Nerfed, nerfed it. That I nerf like gun? that. That's a new one for this old man. <laughs> <laughs> um. All right. So we're going to lighten things up here. You said before that you, there were, areas of your game that you're always looking to improve. There are always things that you're trying to get better at, right? Um, let's say now we have 54, well, including you. So 53 uh, guys on live. If you were to pick each area of a game from each player, who would it be? Does that make any sense? I think I'm making sense. No, it makes sense. Um, who would you want to drive like? Who would you want to hit your irons like? Yeah. Short game, putting, and mental. Uh, Brooks, mental. Um, putting cam, that's pretty easy. <laughs> um, well, you're pretty good. So I yeah. thought you would say yourself. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Keep he's, your putting he's game. really good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, short game, probably P. Reed. P. Reed's nasty. He's absolutely nasty around the greens. Um, wedging, I'll take myself. Wedge distance, I'm pretty good there. Um, irons. Yeah, it's a toss between probably Sergio and Yako. I think I think they're both pretty spectacular stents. Gucci? Sorry? Taylor Gooch? Gooch? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Gooch. <laughs> I was I was I was teammates with Taylor in college. That is not what I remember calling him there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, yeah, no. You should call him that from now on. <laughs> yeah, I might. He'll be like, what's No. Um, no. No. Taylor, no, Taylor's not, like Taylor's unbelievable putter too. I think he'd be he'd yeah. be in contention there with Cam and um Driving. Driving Bryson. Bryson or DJ? Yeah. DJ's 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 really good. Uh, yeah. Very un wow. very I don't want to say he's underrated. He's obviously unbelievable, but like DJ DJ doesn't really ever really miss it off the tee. It's pretty impressive. Did you ever do the math on that pebble in the in the bunker at Jeddah? In the last playoff hole, my dad did, but I can't remember. He he, he I had it about six million dollars that day. Yeah, he texted me and said the number. Six million. Yeah, he yeah. was like, "Man, that's an expensive rock or something like that." <laughs> uh, no, my dad's funny with stuff like that. He'll very very cut and dry. Um, yeah, I think he might have texted uh, me that day too. That's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So we started the interview with a punch. We're ending it with a punch. We're yeah. so nice. One, He's never coming back to this podcast. <laughs> yeah. In the meantime, you um, made okay, him blush with up. his college teammates' uh, nickname. Yes. Yeah. 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 <laughs> okay. Can we maybe ask one final question? Yeah. One final question. What's your definition of success? That's a great question. Um, I think it's it's varied right like if you look at it from winning and losing there's only ever one winner at the end of the day right so 
you know, result, you can be very result based or you can be process based. And I feel like I'm process based and perfect examples like Hong Kong. Like I didn't, didn't, res my results were terrible, but I felt like I was getting better and I felt like the game, like I could see results getting better. Mm -hmm. So I feel more com like I feel much more confident going into Miami because of the process. Like I could have gone out played felt terrible played terrible finished higher but my confidence would have been a little bit less if that makes sense you know so at the end of the day there's only ever one winner like, you know there's going to be there's 54 guys only one guy's going to win and so if you're living your life based on winning and losing you're going to kind of you're going to fail more than you're going to succeed so I, I think for me personally it's just process and so it's like if I can hit certain thresholds or or feel good or, or improve in certain areas that I feel like I'm getting better at, then, you know, it's just going to kind of that continued growth of getting better is, is what you're trying to do. And, you know, you're living in a world where it's just result based, it will drive you insane. And so um, for me, that's kind of what I define success is, is if I continue to feel like I'm getting better each time I play. Awesome stuff. Awesome. Thank That's you, Peter. Nice uh, we'll let deep. you go. Nice and deep, Very. Sue Ann. That's <laughs> <Yeah>. awesome. <laughs> that yeah. was a deep question. That was Not that was that, that was an awesome question. But that I mean, we don't. Yeah, know but that but then he can now podcast. go to sleep thinking about his definition of success. There you go. <laughs> should, go should have said, lay it down is, on the couch. It is past my bedtime, to be fair. Time and other time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, we'll let you go. Uh, thank you so Cheers, much for man. your time, Pete. Always appreciate you. Uh, yes, we'll see you in Miami on your side of the pond. There you go. Cheers, guys. All right, see All right take care now. Bye. I love Pete. He is one of those guys that seriously does not take himself too seriously, and he will be the first to make fun of himself. Yeah. It's, it's, he's such, he's so much fun, honestly, to be around and talk to. I love it. I have always gravitated in my in my 61 years of of archaeology living as as I am a bit of a fossil. I have always <laughs> gravitated away Don't from give ego. yourself that much credit. I've always gravitated away from egos in my entire in my entire professional life in my entire personal life. I've always gravitated away from egos. And I always love being around the people who don't take themselves too seriously what they do too seriously or life too seriously. And he fits all three of those categories. Yeah, I remember when I interviewed him, was it a uh, Mayakoba 2023? And I think he had made a big number. Was it the 11th? 12th. 12th. Yeah, yeah. the 12th. And yeah. I think I asked, you know, what he would have done differently. He goes, skip the 12th. <laughs> and this wasn't a live <laughs> interview. <laughs> it just, But that just shows kind of his personality and who he really yeah. is. You know, I mean, he's just lost a tournament. You know, he was in contention. He messed up a hole, made a big number. He hit a small bucket of the balls off the tee. He hit it left and then hit provisional after provisional trying to find that fairway, mm -hmm. and it was unforgiving hole at 12. And the funny part is I ran into him for the very first time, Mayakoba, driving around the cart during a practice round this year. And he's walking right. off the 11th green. I'm like, oh, shit. This is, this, and it's his first time seeing the 12th hole. He just looks over. He goes, Fultzy, came to witness the scene of the crime. I'm like, <laughs> I have then, never then talked to him about it since then. I'm like, did you just not want to walk back and hit another? Because he's he's taken relief 100 yards off the tee in the middle of the forest, taking a penalty shot and chipping it out to where he could go back to the tee and hit his third shot. Yeah. Five iron yeah. pass it. And he and he told Zadaga, I'm not going back to that tee. I am not going back. Yeah, he again. told Dom that. that yeah, he goes. Again. Yeah. Yeah, I, th I think he said to Don, there's no fucking way I'm going back to that tee box. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, but then didn't you see him at the next scene of the crime um, in Jeddah? Was it on the yeah. 18th? <laughs> next time I saw him, was Jeddah, uh, driving along with the car. And there he is on the green at 18. I'm like, holy Christ. The, I think it was yeah. about, well, the, 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 the pebble in the bunker, which ultimately led to him losing the playoff to Brooke um it was it was over as soon as that that uh, bunker shot went in the water he caught a pebble between the ball and the face he would have finished he had a chance for um second in the bonus pool third so eight, with the no. individual right yeah no second in the individual which brendan grace ended up getting he had a chance That's for right. that but that cost him so that is four million right there 
and the difference between winning the tournament and finishing second, which is four versus two point uh, two point four five or something. So you have five and a half, almost six million dollars for one pebble. One pebble. <laughs> I know. How many holes did they play that year? Do you remember? Four? Did they play? The I think fourth? it was. Oh, the third. It was, it was his fourth time on the hole. I think the third playoff hole might have been the fourth playoff. Yeah. Hole. Yeah. I don't know. I feel like his vibe, and like you said, he has no ego, you know. And yeah, so he, none. he, of all people, in those moments where it's so painful, you know, it is so painful, and you just lost the tournament, and he did it yeah. again in Mayakoba. He still had a sense of humor about it, you know. Yeah. He just feel. I feel like he has his life in perspective. Does that make sense? I, I totally yeah. agree. And, and and you think of his upbringing. Yeah. I mean, that has to come from Wally and Tina. It has to, because, you know, he was always the son growing up. He was the son of the guy who runs titles. So the, I mean, the the behemoth of all OEMs. Yeah. Um, and they have, I'm sure he didn't struggle for opportunity. Obviously always had nice clubs and he, but he, <laughs> that you don't see, Involves. you don't sense that side of him. If there is, if, I mean, you don't sense that that was ever a part of who he was. He had no. to have the most grounded parents ever to, to turn out the way he did growing up in a rather privileged and uh, a family who earned enough money to lead a privileged life. Yeah, yeah, no, I love yeah. him, and I, I really hope to see him do really well this year. He he definitely has the game for it. If he can straighten out that driver, find the fairway, and with that deadly putter that he has, he's definitely yeah. a, a chance this year. Um, okay, Fulty, we didn't get to talk about this at the top of the show, but I wanted to hear your thoughts. Oh boy, on what the world number one recently said this Rom? week. Ram was talking. <laughs> I didn't see any quotes. Scotty Scheffler. We do not refer um, to numbers anymore because we have right, dissolved yeah. ourselves well, from OWGR speak lingo. Okay, well, he just won the um, one of the best the players in the world. That's in yes, your backyard. Yeah. Yeah. It yeah. was awesome. Yeah. It was awesome. All right. This is what he said, and I want your reaction to it because I really love it when you rant, Jerry. If guys want to go take the money and leave, then that's their decision. I'm not going to sit there and tell guys not to take hundreds of millions of dollars. If that's what they think is best for their life, then go do it. I'm not going to sit here and force guys to stay on our tour. But at the end of the day, this is where I want to be. And we're continuing to grow what we're doing. And what they're doing is not really a concern to me. There's a certain group of guys that aren't getting any ranking points. It was Kind of the thing that you saw when guys went to live. Their golf games took a little bit of a hit, just basically from a strokes gain perspective. The world rankings, I still think, is a good ranking system, but it's missing a few players for sure. Yeah, no, that's complete. I mean, that's fine. I don't, I don't have any issue with what he said. Just kind of had buried a little bit in the sand there toward the end that that the world rankings are working fine. They're not world rankings, they're PGA Tour rankings. He's the number one PGA Tour player, thus the number one. There's only four guys in the top 50 of those uh, formerly OWGR that aren't PGA Tour members. And they're all four members of LIV, two recently signed, three being uh, major winners within the last two years. That's, I mean, the, it's it's comical if anybody, anybody in the world of golf, especially the PGA Tour, thinks that those rankings are, are even a, every, even, a small percentage of those rankings are accurate. They're not, they're, they're awful. And they, they, they don't belong in golf anymore. The majors are starting to realize that um, there's baby steps being made, obviously with Joaquin being invited to the PGA and the masters. And those steps will get bigger because those majors have a duty uh, well above any kind of obligation they feel to Jay Monahan and the PGA tour. And that duty is to their institutions and, and they will honor that in time. And I'm sure it'll be actually sooner rather than later, but I also think a deal is going to happen um, before we need to even address that. Yeah, well, I think Jay Monahan, Monahan said something at the, the press, I think, during Bay Hill, I think it was, right? Yeah. The, the bigger issue I had, said that, yeah, uh, yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, it's okay. I think he said something along the lines of we have to do it in negotiations aren't successful when it's out in public or something along those lines. Yeah, um, no, that's not verbatim, obviously. Yeah, he's doing what he has yeah. to do. Yeah. He's doing, yeah. I mean, what, what, Jay Monahan, what Jay Monahan is doing is, I mean, it's obviously baffling to a lot of people, a lot of the members, and you heard Xander Shoffley speak about it, that he's still the commissioner. Um, but what he's doing is exactly that which he should do. And he stated it, it's to try and put the PGA Tour in the best position I possibly can now and moving forward. 
Um, honestly, uh, obviously, he's admitted to having made mistakes. And I think coming out in that 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 anti live and empowering and and weaponizing families of 9/11 against us is something that he'll regret forever. And and he says he's learned from the mistakes he made. Um, but moving forward, he's trying to do the best he can. I know that that uh, the people behind our organization are trying to do the best to accomplish their objectives from from a uh, from a business standpoint. I, I think there's going to be a a really a good. I mean, the one thing Jay said that I love is we're committed to uh, gl globally growing the game of golf, and I think that is. When it's all said and done and all this smoke is cleared, I think that is what we're going to see is is a global impact on the game of golf and the communities that golf visits that we've never seen before. Yeah, well, I can't wait for us to get to that point. I almost wish that we could fast forward it because as I always point out, I think, you know, it's the fans, right? The fans aren't getting. Uh, yeah, everybody gives them lip service, don't they? Everybody gives them lip yeah. service, but they're they're yeah. totally not part of the negotiations. Yeah. 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 Anyways, on that note, thanks for that, Jerry. That was always good. Yeah. Another round with Fulty last week, I have to say, was one of your best. I hate to admit Thank that, you. but it was Thank really freaking good, dude. You're it was sweet. good. Well, on that note, thank you so much for joining us this week. If you like our podcast, you can go and subscribe and you can find us wherever you get your podcasts. If you want to watch this whole thing on video, you can as well. You can find it on the Live Golf Plus app as well as our Live Golf YouTube page. For now, Fulty, I'll see you next week. Same time, same place. Back here on the Zoom boxes. Back here on the zoom boxes yes that's cool. right um i miss doing this on site folks I, me I too miss it. me too i would yeah, love to do it so on, i would love to do it sitting next to you every single week of the year but it's sure as hell ain't going to do that in singapore so you need to move to the floor mm, yeah all right yeah. anyways we'll see you next week thanks for joining <laughs>